Well, good evening. That wasn't nearly loud enough for me personally, uh, but I love Terry McCallum. I don't know about any of you, but I uh, really enjoy him. All right, if you would turn me to First Peter chapter 5. And actually, I forgot to ask. Oh. Is there anyone tonight that's here that's coming for prayer for cancer or something that would, is uh, terminal? Anybody tonight like that? I don't have good eyes, but I don't see anybody. Just checking. All right, first Peter chapter five. Then I, if someone were, I was gonna go a different direction, but uh, since no one, I don't see anyone like that. Father Don, it's good to see you over there. It's like wherever you go, there's break-ins and lawlessness. What's going on? Don, in the same neighborhood and the other morning, after 4th of July, he went lifting weights early in the morning and uh, some kids had broken into our rec center where he was lifting weights. He's talking to them, trying to lead them to Jesus. They ran off with $7,000 worth of stuff. <laughs> so anyway, they caught him though, right? Got two, of them. two of them, all right. Anyway, we've had a lot going on. All right, this evening, uh, I've taught on this before, but I just, this is the reading, uh, the epistle reading for this week. Uh, it's the third Sunday after Trinity uh, in our old lectionary. And the lectionary is a way of reading the Bible. In the early church, they wanted to make sure that people did not just focus and spend all their time preaching on one or two things. Uh, I grew up in churches that literally, well, I say literally, it felt like that they were either preaching on the rapture or hell about 98% of the time. And the other two days were Mother's Day and Father's Day. But I say uh, if we had liturgical color, it was black all the time. That's not a liturgical color, by the way. But anyway, well, it's kind of, I guess, in the old church, they used to have black for deaths and things. But it was, uh, it was out of proportion. Uh, they were not preaching the whole counsel of God. They, they focused on a few special topics that they loved, and they focused on that. And it's possible to do that. Well, in the early church, they divided up the, ch the readings of the Bible, connected with how the Jews read the Bible, of course, and the, and the Torah portions and things. But they divided up so that in the 52 weeks of the year, you would hit all the major doctrines and that you would focus on. So they were divided into seasons and they were progressive and there was an order. So starting in Advent, the first four Sundays, of course, focus on the second coming of Jesus uh, and the need then to get in right relationship with Jesus to prepare for celebrating his first coming. The best way, of course, is to be ready for his second coming in terms of holiness of life, not, not calendar dates and all these sorts of things. But nonetheless... There was Advent and then the Epiphany, which is the manifestation of, of God's grace to the Gentiles. That It's, of course, the, the Jews were included in salvation. What was amazing and what we see at the story of the wise men was that the Gentiles would be included in this great thing. And so that even at Jesus' birth, the wise men were included, which represented Gentiles, et, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the whole church year is built that way. Uh, and, um, and it focuses us and keeps us centered, hopefully, on the majors, although we have freedom to do a book study, and, and I think over the next few weeks we start with 1 Samuel. I got a feeling I'm going to be preaching through uh, most of 1 Samuel uh, over the next coming weeks, which is a departure from the basic lectionary. But the idea of the lectionary, I think, is a very helpful one and a good one. Uh, but nonetheless, so tonight I'm going to preach on or teach on 1 Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 5. And um, it's got some important things about spiritual warfare and some other things. So nonetheless, uh, he starts out in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter does, in talking about the importance of how elders are to act and to, to focus on their ministry and not on money and all kind of other things. Well, you know, what's interesting is that we live in the days of so, much, so many extremes, where there's churches where pastors are incredibly underpaid and places where pastors 
if they're not fleecing the flock, they are living, the flock is living vicariously through their economic success and perhaps hoping to bless the pastors in such a way that they can get part of the blessing as if the anointing and the grace of God can happen through financial things, as if we could uh, 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 give in such a way in which we get rather than to give to worship. And we live in a, in a day in which uh, there's so many pastors that are impoverished that unnecessarily uh, as a form of control, uh, even as we have pastors who seem to be, uh, even if you understand what double honor means, uh, it seems to be way out of proportion. Uh, now, I personally want you to know, if a pastor writes a bunch of books and does different things, write their sermon series, I, I don't, in my personal opinion, there's nothing wrong if someone writes a books that make money on their books. Now, if you get the church to buy all the books and you force people or something, that's another story. Uh, but meaning, I don't see, some people, I mean, I don't know much about Joel Osteen and I don't really care, I hate to say it like that. But I hear people bad-mouthing him and from what I understand, his salary from the church is not very big. Whatever you agree, think about his teaching, and I have people that I know that I respect who think highly of him, and there's people that I know and respect who do not think as highly of him. But I personally don't think that it's wrong. However, again, I don't have time to evaluate all his theology and do all this stuff. I'm, I'm busy, like most of us. But I don't think it's wrong for him to write books. Uh, he may be accountable if his books aren't good. I mean, that's a different question. But let's assume his books were perfect. Okay? I don't think there's anything wrong with him writing books and making money. Personally, I don't think. I don't see why that he wouldn't have the right of anybody else. Um, but anyway, I think that we live in an age of lots of issues, etc. Peter starts out talking about that. Then he moves on and he talks, he moves from talking about, uh, there's a difference of opinion among scholars when he says elders and, young, and younger men here, whether he's talking about just older people or if he is talking about those in authority. I think by context, he has just been talking about elders who are clearly pastors in the church and therefore I believe that when he gets into verse 5 he is talking about the younger men and their submission to the older men or the word elder here which would mean pastors in the church and I believe here it's actually talking about not simply those who are old in years uh, but rather those who are elders in the church and those things are often together uh, by the way uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's different ways. Good people disagree about that, and I'm just letting you know. I take it to mean he's telling younger men to submit to their pastors. That's what I believe here. Now, are there ex we live in a day of exceptions and extremes. What would you do if your pastor told you to have an affair with them? You say no, of course. I mean, meaning there's, yes, there's exceptions. We focus so much on the 1% or less than 1% of exceptions that we don't do the 90% or 99%. There are exceptions. If a pastor told you something's evil or something's sinful, something, of course, absolutely, there are limits. Okay, there are, of course. But Peter or Paul can't say all the, all the extreme cases. If you spend all your time saying all that stuff, you'll never get to say anything that you're supposed to say. But it goes without saying. There's plenty of places in the scriptures where we know that if someone in authority tells you something that's evil or sinful, you are not bound to obey it. Everyone got that? Includes me or anyone else. All right? That goes without saying. Um, so, likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. In this case, I believe talking about those in spiritual authority over you. Now listen, submission is to voluntarily yield your rights to someone else. Okay? It can't be forced. I mean, I can't say, well, I'm your pastor. You have to do what I say. I mean, I can say that. But if you have to say that, you've lost the battle of credibility and integrity, if you have to say that. All right? Meaning, it, ultimately, this comes down to respect for Jesus or not. But I'm going to tell you something. It is not submission if you only do it when you agree with people. That makes you a rebel, just so you know. Meaning, the whole point of submission is we're choosing. Here's someone who's walked with Jesus longer, who's gifted to lead the church. Therefore, I will listen to what the person says as long as they're not contradicting scripture, but meaning we, we, we submit to that out of trust of the integrity of process, relationship, and, and we say, I don't see it, but since you've been there before, I used to have an African-American elder who trained me. He was such a wonderful man. I, I found out that I missed his funeral. I wasn't notified. His wife died first, and I guess that's why I didn't hear, but I would have gone back to Mississippi in a heartbeat to see Brother Jimmy Jackson's funeral. I would have done it in a heartbeat. But he was so kind. He had won the Silver Star in World War II. And he used to say to me in the kindest way, he, he was a real man. He used to say to me, Ron, 
I have been where you're going in the kindest way. Meaning if a man ever went out of his way to make a younger, obstinate, difficult young man that he could see the good in me, but he also knew what it was like to be young and, and, and think you knew everything and, all, and he saw all that, but he was so kind to me. But he used to say, I've been where you're going. And, and he was so kind, I kinda, I'd like to think I listened to him. I hope so. You know, we're not always judge ourselves very well. But, but I got it. He wasn't trying to get his way. He wasn't trying to, to um, take advantage of me. In fact, he would have done anything to help me out, and I was clear about that. And it was true. It hit me. I'm, I'm 22 or I'm 23 or whatever, and, and this guy's been there. And I would do, it would do well for me to listen to someone with that kind of wisdom and godliness. And it was clear to me that he was wise and he was godly. And uh, I made it my business to attempt. I don't know how I did, but it was, I made it my business to listen to him as best I could. But I did not always see it. That's the whole point. The blessing that comes with submission is we find people who are godly, who are mentors, are leading us, and, and we listen to them. We don't see it, but they've been around the corner before. So they can tell us. They can help. That's the idea. All right? But it's not just submit. We have a day in which people think, I will do it. You know, I'll, I'll submit whenever I agree. You're not submitting until you don't agree and you say, but I'm going to trust you. Ultimately, your submission tells you about your faith in Jesus. Meaning you have to have a lot of faith to submit to a husband or, remember, it's voluntarily to do and to give your rights to someone else. Within the confines of God, there's boundaries within the confines of Scripture. The Bible says submit yourself to one another. Being, but if you're going to be in a submitted relation to a boss, to government, whatever, you have to believe, when you look at the government all messed up, we're supposed to submit to the government. You have to believe that God is bigger than the evil and the wickedness which is manifest in the government to do that. So you're saying, but when I honor this principle, I can count on God taking care of me. If you don't have much respect for God and fear of God, you will not be able to submit yourself to people, institutions that the Bible says you should do. Okay, All you'll be able to do is focus on their weaknesses if you don't have respect and the fear of the Lord. All right, I, I was telling my nephew today, who's visiting, I said, I can look back and say, an awful lot of times I didn't do this. I've, I've gotten better at it through the years. But in my 20s, I was, I was a, if it makes good sense to me kind of person. That wasn't submission at all. And it, and I, it costs you when you, you, you reap what you sow. I could go on and on just about that one verse, but here we go. Likewise, you younger bit, submit yourselves. That's to voluntarily choose to yield your rights for the good of the other, or in this case, the church. Okay, within the boundaries of nothing that's sinful, abusive, none of those things, of course, are included in that. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Meaning, the church and any good family, it's, it's based upon a humility that expresses itself in mutual care. Mutual submission. Right? That, that's the foundation of sort of a charitable and loving relationships. That we don't just do what's good for us, but we choose to do what's good for everybody in the family. All right, that's, and, and, and that's true, of course, in the church family. A healthy church family is not going to be a bunch of people who are claiming their rights or trying to put you in the pyramid, sch pyramid scheme or put you in the pecking order so they can get more out of you. Okay, you're supposed to have enough sense to stay away from that. That's, that's the worldly leadership. The church is found on respect and principles of honor in which people have so much respect and honor for Jesus that they're living that way and they're inviting you and asking you to follow them as they follow Jesus. Okay, and to do that requires mutual submission. Okay, again, obedience is simply doing it. Okay, submission is the voluntary choice to supplement your rights, to yield your rights to the good of the other or the organization or whatever, or the government, whatever. Okay, it's a, it's a voluntary choice. Cannot be coerced, by the way. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed humility. Of course, only humble people can do this. And humble people, by the way, do not think less about themselves. That is false humility, and that's a self-esteem problem. Okay, that's not humility. Humility is you just don't think about yourself because you know God's thinking about you. Do you know I have a wife that thinks about me? I'm really blessed. If I don't think about me, she thinks about me. She takes care. She, she thinks of all kinds of stuff that I don't even think about. I pretty much restri restrict most of my thinking to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Other than that, I don't pay a lot. Susie pays attention to all that. She's fantastic. 
Because I'm so well loved, I get to focus on other things. The idea is humble people, we are not worrying about ourselves because you can't just be humble like that unless you have learned to trust in the Lord. Because if you know the Lord's going to take care of you, it may take a while, some seasons, they're suffering, but, but if you know the Lord's got your back and he's taking care of you and your needs, once you learn that, then you don't have to focus and worry about yourselves. We move from graspers who need to take everything and suck the life of everybody into givers. Because we know as the old song, you can't outgive God. Meaning when we live a life of service and love and submission to other people, Jesus just blesses us more and more and more. The problem is it doesn't always happen day one, two, three. I Meaning sometimes you give and you give, it goes like this. But then all of a sudden, Jesus breaks through and he goes way up here. And you're like, my goodness, if I had done my, I would never deserve this. Just so, so the Lord, it requires faith because there's suffering and difficult and challenges and sometimes it gets worse. And then Jesus, he pours out his honor, his blessing upon us. So we clothe ourselves in humility, we, humility, we submit to one another because we've learned to know the goodness of God and to put our trust in him. That's how this thing works. God resists the proud. The people who are focused on themselves in this case, there's all kinds of facets of pride. And here, it's people who are taking and worried about themselves, demanding their way, their rights, their wants, and their needs. Those are the people here are, are defined by the proud. It's, and he's opposing that to people who are submitting to one another who are clothed in humility. Now, this is hard because if you were raised in families and relationships where you didn't have your needs met, it's very hard, but that's why there's healing. That's why there's deliverance. That's why there's all kind of stuff. So that you can get the healing and experience God's grace in the places where you've been wounded so that you can function like this. But ultimately, you have to experience the power of the Holy Spirit and God's love in those places where you were not loved well so that you can then finally get over that. Otherwise, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, this thing happened when you're 7 or 15, but you're 70 now. You're 30 now. Yes, those things are real and they're big, but that's why we pursue healing. So that, in a sense, the rim of the tire doesn't always just keep going on like that. And a lot of us just didn't know God will heal that. But let me tell you, he will. He will. God resists the proud. Can you imagine all the problems that I have? Can you imagine willfully knowing I'm going to go in a track where God himself is going to oppose me? Let me tell you something. You can't afford and I can't afford to be acting and living in a way that's prideful, knowing that God himself will oppose us. I got enough things opposing me, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Can you imagine putting God on that list? Not a chance. But he gives grace to the humble. In this case, part of our humility is expressing itself in submitting ourselves and our will for the good of the other into leadership, of course, there's, in this book, he talks about government and other things. I mean, there's many things. Right now, he's talking about leadership. All right? So, but there's grace for the humble, which is a principle which is bigger than the specific context, but there is a specific context here, which is submission to leadership. All right, six. Therefore, in light of the fact that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, he's talking, and remember, in the New Testament, the great story that's the metaphor of which the cross is the exodus. All right, so, so here you, the, the readers wouldn't help but be thinking about God humbling Pharaoh, who called himself God. Not unlike Caesar Augustus, were the first uh, of the Caesars to say that they were God. The other Caesars didn't claim to be God. Caesar Augustus claimed to be God. All right, and Jesus came at that time. Uh, Jesus set the people free in the Passover through Moses. All right, so the mighty, the thing, the powerful acts of God. The mighty hand of God, right? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Oh, man, isn't that good to know that even whatever suffering or difficulty you're going through, he will exalt you in due time. That's pretty neat, isn't it? But those of you who have the, half, the glass half empty would say, when's that time? When is due time? Well, I always tell them it's, it's been past due time. Whenever I'm suffering, going, I say, where is it? Well, I have experienced many of these cases where God in his kindness 
came along and exalted me and blessed me far beyond my wildest dreams in this life. But the promise here is ultimately not until the second coming. Hate to tell you that. I don't hate to tell you. That's what the scripture tells you. You are guaranteed that no matter how awful or terrible or unjust things are in this life, that there is a due time coming. There is an end of it coming. And when Jesus returns, everything which has not been right will be made right. Every injustice, every sl everything will be exposed and Jesus will be exalted and those who love him and fear him, the mighty hand of God will expose us in the most wonderful way by his grace and he will exalt us in that due time. The only guarantee, now again, we, we, sometimes we're blessed and along my life God has blessed me incredibly beyond what I deserve it and sometimes in the most magnificent ways. But the ultimate thing he's talking about here is when Jesus returns. All right? Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. All the fears that were never going to be loved, never going to be listened to, never going to be heard, all the, meaning we see the imperfect way this world is and the people around us are and our marriages are and the best spouses can't meet all our needs or fill us up. And so it feels like, but he says you put all that anxiety, all that care upon him and the motivation because he truly cares. Henry Blackaby the famous Southern Baptist was experiencing God. He said, and I don't know how a guy like this, the Holy, Holy Spirit could bless him, but he said as a new believer, he decided when he thought about Jesus dying from the cross, he decided that he would make it his discipline to interpret everything that happened in his life, no matter how bad, through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ, knowing that God absolutely loved him and cared for him, and therefore that would be the interpretive lens by which he would interpret everything, no matter how bad, is knowing God loved him so much to die for him. That's powerful. How he figured that out as a young boy, you know, only the Holy Spirit. Because we could tell people that, but for them to get hold of that, that's something that's revealed to people by the Holy Spirit. It took me a lot of years to begin. I hope I understand that. I think I do, but again, we all think lots of things until what? Until suffering comes. When suffering comes, we find out what we really think and what we really feel and what we really believe. Everybody can do all right or most of us can do all right in the pretty good days. So, casting all your care upon him, for he cares to you. Now, this is, in the Greek, this is like casting all your cares. And this is like to throw, like, if, you know, the way you might cast your, it's like you're throwing it on him. But this is, the idea here is that you do it, and it's a once for all, by the way. Isn't that something? Now, I've had to do it a few times. I've taken, here's the thing. Sometimes we take them back. It's kind of like forgiveness. Sometimes we forgive and then we start thinking about it and we take all that unforgiveness and bitterness back. But the idea is here that the Holy Spirit would enable us to cast all of the cares of our life in a singular movement of the soul, aligned by the Spirit and God's Word, where we could be free of this stuff and we wouldn't have to take it back. In some areas of my life, I think I've seen a lot of this, a good fruit. But there are times that certain things I thought I was doing really good until what? Your kids grow up. And I got really good kids, but you know, then you start worrying, well, what about them? What about their spouses? What about their careers? What about their mission trips? I, mean, I used to be like all oh, those parents that don't want their kids to go on missions. They're just cowards. They're just cowards. That's what I thought when I was a young minister. Now I got my kids saying, well, my kid's going to India or something. I'm thinking, be safe, be careful, hold hands, stay in the group. <laughs> it all changes when you get older. I was wild and crazy. But for my kids, all of a sudden, I, I turn into a coward. And that's not good, by the way. It's not good. I mean, we want to be smart, but it's not good. So I thought I was doing well. And then all of a sudden, anxiety as a parent comes in, and I've got to pray. But isn't that wonderful? I get to pray. Okay, it's not surprising that I experience some anxiety. What's wonderful is I do know what to do with it. That's the good part. I do know what to do with it. And I get to pray. Six, be sober. Now the idea here is don't live as sober. Sobriety, of course, is talking about not being drunk specifically. But in the context here, sobriety is saying live a well-balanced life. Because if your life is not balanced, you are more open. He's going to go into four things here which will help us against the demonic attacks of the enemy. Four things. The first one is live a balanced life. All right, one of the big ones I have not done well of is taking care of my physical health. That matters. All right, if nothing else, it matters because not being in balance in my physical health can make it more open to other things in that area of attack. 
If we're not balanced in our eating, if we're not balanced in our exercise, in our prayer, in our reading the scripture, these things open us up to certain kinds of attacks that would not be there if we were living a sober or balanced life. Okay? And, and I've, I don't know why the lights clicked on. It took me 50, 51 years to start realizing, you know what? This is not just separate. This is an important thing. And so I've been working on it. But it's slow. That's part of balance. You don't, you don't get the cruise ship turned around in a, in a short time, right? It takes a while to make the U-turn. But we're moving forward with that. Be sober. Be vigilant. Meaning, you must anticipate. You must be on watch in such a way that you anticipate knowing that the devil is an enemy. He's alive and well. We're not devil, we're not devil like freaked out all the time, but we're aware. Be vigilant. When my wife goes in the refrigerator, you know one of the things that she does? She says, how long has the salad dressing been in there? I never would throw anything away. Susan goes in, this is expired three months ago. What'd she do? She throws it away. She's vigilant, because why? She doesn't want us to get sick. Right? She want, so therefore, she, she's vigilant. She's on watch for these things. So there is a sobriety. There's a balance of life, number one. If some of us are workaholics and we're not, there's not enough rest in our lives for us to think or to hear the Holy Spirit or to do all kinds of things. Because our idolatry and our insecurity is causing us to work and work and work because we're afraid of not, afraid of not being successful, not having enough money, whatever it is. There's a whole host of things. So there's a sobriety of balance. There's a vigilance of knowing, hey, the enemy's alive and well. I, I, I can't just wait. Right? I mean, you know, you sit, to, what was it, uh, I'm trying to think who was it, Wyatt Earp, whatever, you know, they always sat with their back to the wall, always looking for the gunfighter coming in, right? You don't put your back, so I mean, there's, you're being alert. When you're hunting, I like to hunt. I got to be alert. If I don't, my dad taught me, as a little boy, to look into and imagine a tail or a sight, so I, like a template, and I'm looking in the tree, and all of a sudden, you see deer you never would have saw. You say, oh, that looks like it could be a leg. And sure enough, if you wait long enough, all of a sudden it moves. Then you know it's a deer. Then the heart starts pumping. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, you're, you're watchful. You're, antici- you're aware of what's going on. Now listen, by this age, most of us are, are over 20 in here. Not all maybe, but most of us. By this time, you should know there's three or four or five areas that the devil gets you in all the time. You don't have to look for every trick in the book. You fall for the same three or four things. Right? I fall, fall for the double quarter pounder and cheese all the time. You know, I don't have to worry when I go to a vegetarian restaurant about overeating. Right? I mean, so I just got to be alert. I mean, you, we, we have things in which we realize these are the places where the devil's got us in the past. You begin to learn. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, this is like the legal, you know, when Satan talked to, to the Lord for Job. This is what the commentators take you to. When he came and accused, that's the accuser, he's up there speaking against us, slandering us, speaking against us in the court of heaven, so to speak. So to, yeah, so to speak, as a metaphor. Okay, so he, your adversary is like the, 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 the attorney against you. He's there and he's causing a mess. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. The metaphor here is for a lion who they would roar to freak out the impala or whatever it is. And if the impala freak, they scatter. When they scatter, they're able to be killed by the lions. When they stay together, they're safe. But the roar of the lion makes them scatter. And then as they're scattered individual, they can be picked off. The young, the old, whatever it is. Okay, the idea here is, is that roar. He's tethered. But if we don't understand what's going on, we can act a fool and we can open ourselves up where we will fall for things that if we were paying attention and in balance, we would have never fallen for. What's the famous thing with addictions, which is also true about sin? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Okay, you will do things, whether it's affairs, whatever it is. When you are hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, it's halt. They'll teach you that, and I haven't, I've been addicted to food, but not anything else. But the point is, it is a very important thing. Okay, when do most ministers have affairs? Sunday night, Monday. Because that's their low time. They've just given, the Lord's been, the Holy Spirit. 
But then there's the death. And so when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that's when people, self-pity, all kinds of things will happen, and they'll give in a temptation, whether it's pornography or this, or yelling at the wife, or whatever it is, there's a cycle. It's a common cycle. It's written about. Okay? But hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You need to look at those times of the week and times of the day when those things, when you are more vulnerable than at other times. Because your adversary, he's tethered, but if you're not living in balance and alertness, when he roars, we can act a fool. That's why we're being told to be prepared in advance. All right, verse 9. Resist him. Don't give in. Resist him. It feels like he's too strong. So what's the point of resisting the devil who is way stronger than you? What's the point? Well, whether you realize it at that moment, God is with you. And when you resist him, it is an act of faith, and God will come to your rescue. Okay? God always shows up. But I've been in many situations where it felt like there was no way to resist a certain sin or whatever it was. But when I began to resist, I read A.W. Tozer as a young child, 12, 13 years old, I don't know, child, young man. Maybe 10. I don't know. I couldn't have been too young. But I wasn't too old. And it's a book called I Taught Back to Devil. Important book about resisting temptation. <laughs> really helpful. I still remember it. I haven't read it since. I'm 51. Principles that he taught them, I still remember. And one of them is it doesn't feel like God is there. But when you begin to resist him, God's grace begins to pour out. And Jesus' spirit in my heart begins to well up. And the Holy Spirit comes. And when you resist him, the grace comes to stand against it. But you have to activate your choice. He does the work, but you have to activate the choice to not give in to the enemy. That's your, God's part is to give you the strength. Your part is to activate your will against the work of devil and aligned with the will of Jesus Christ and God's word. That's your part. God will not do your part for you. But if you will do your part, he brings this power and the strength. Tozer said, and using the illustration, probably a little different analogy, thinking of the book, but nonetheless, it's a good principle. He said it's like a garage door opener. You, your will is like pushing the button. The machine does all the work. So saying God does the work, but you must activate your will. When you activate your will with Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come and do the work. All right, but you have a part. If you don't do your part with your will, your will is the one thing that you're in charge of and responsible for. If you don't activate your will, God will not do that for you. Okay, now if you're a baby Christian, you don't know, God gives grace there. But as you grow, you have to activate your will or you won't grow. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Meaning, one of the lies of self-pity is, no one's going through what I'm going through. You don't know how bad my wife is. You don't know how bad my husband is. I had this prophetic word in this ministry, and he's holding me back. If I, if I told you my own sin, let alone things I've heard from people. Self-pity is the entry drug for all kinds of sins. You're it's so unfair, it's so unjust, and of course it is. That's why Jesus died. The whole world is all screwed up. But the fact the world's unjust and messed up is not the reason to, to go into sin. So he's saying, hey, steadfast in faith, resist the devil, knowing that the same sufferings, you're not going, you're not so, it, you know, oh, I'm the only one. No, no, you're not. A whole lot of other people had to stand firm. In fact, everybody who grows in the kingdom has had to go through these same things. The temptations may be different, the circumstances, but everybody gets tested deeply and profoundly. And we have to die to self-pity. It's a demon, but it's also a character weakness. Knowing that the same sufferings, the same exact sufferings, are experienced all over the place. And other people are holding on and finding Jesus will pour out his spirit and help them. And he will help you too. Ten. But may the God of all grace, he is not limited in his grace, who called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while. And he is telling us now, what is the purpose? Why does God allow suffering? Well, there are many reasons, but here there are four. And I love these four reasons. James Montgomery Boyce, the famous pastor at 10th Pres in Philly, 
He wrote a little commentary on this book. Years ago I read it, and I still remember his metaphors for these Greek words. And I'm going to share them with you tonight as best I can get them. I didn't, uh, I've got the book someplace, but I didn't look it back up. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to be pretty daggone close here. But I learned it years ago because of this famous Presbyterian, incredible Bible teacher. All right. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, what are the effects that come? Number one, perfect you or mature you. This is to restore you. This idea here of teleos or maturity, the idea here is it was used when they would take the nets out and they would break and they would sit and they'd have to, they'd have to fix the nets. Or if you had a broken arm, they'd have to fix the arm. This is to restore you back to your original condition. So through the process of suffering and what you're learning here is allowing in your need and desperation and your focus on God, the Holy Spirit's coming and he's refining you and is restoring you what God always intended you to be. He's getting the weakness out of you. What, what did uh, the famous coach said that, this, that the pain was weakness leaving the body. Famous Packer coach. I can't remember his name all of a sudden. You all know it. It's big, famous. Lombardi, yes. That was his big quote. Okay, suffering is, is uh, the shortcut to maturity. Or to growth and promotion. That's the English guy. I can't think of his name either. Sorry. You guys look. Graham Cook. Love you guys. Love because a lot of people here love Graham Cook. That's one of his great statements. Half the stuff he says I'm not sure about. Doesn't sound bad, but I can't tell what he's talking about. I guess that's when you're a spiritual giant. People like me have no clue what he's talking about. But I tell you what. That when he said that, I knew it was true. Suffering is the shortcut to spiritual promotion. I think is the exact quote. But that's pretty close. That's what he was saying. That is true. Why? Because the flames of suffering, one of the reasons God is it forces us to draw near to Jesus. And in that purifying fire, we get restored in our character, in our spirit. It aligns itself in that fire. It molds into the shape of Jesus in the most beautiful ways. So God allows it. He doesn't like it, but he allows it because he is producing good. Even through the evil of the enemy, he is producing good in your life. Number one, he'll restore you. Number two, our perfect, it says in New King James, but it is the word to complete, mature, it's teleos. Number two, he will establish you, and that is to make you like concrete. He'll make you like concrete. He'll, he'll, he, will, he will establish you. Three, he will strengthen you. And this is to give you the strength of a lion. I know some of you have seen baboons. Those baboons are strong. The gorillas are strong. But it's like the, the strength of the lion. I think linebacker. You know, I mean, this is like, this a raw energy and strength, power. He's going to strengthen you. So he's going to restore you. He's going to make you like concrete. I've seen people where we prayed, and it's like the Lord gives them an iron rod or steel in their back where they've been pushed out. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes, and you just see this beautiful strength that comes, and they're like concrete. And then he, has, he, he, makes, them, he makes them strong here. He strengthens them, gives them that strength and that energy that they need. And then settle you. And that is to shake you down so that nothing else can be shaken. That is to fix you in the foundation. And the foundation, of course, is Jesus. He's like shaking you so everything loose. You know, they do the shakedown cruise, the boats. I don't want to be on any shakedown cruise. I want to be on after the shakedown cruise. But in the shakedown cruise, they, they find all the different things that aren't going to go right. And things that aren't tight as they thought. And this and that. And the position of this is wrong. They, they find that out in the test drive. God is going to rattle, shake everything so that everything which can be shaken, meaning everything which is not really you and will not be with you with Jesus for all eternity, he'll get out of there. There's some things of the devil. There's some things of the world and some things of the flesh. Do you know that your true self will be completely comfortable for all eternity in the presence of Jesus? If there's anything in you that would not be completely comfortable with Jesus in the Holy of Holies for all eternity, that isn't your true self because your true self... Your true self will be complete. Everything else has got to go. It'll either be transformed or gotten rid of. But either way, it's going. Because your true identity in Christ is, it's all there. For, it will, you will be completely comfortable with Jesus. So this part, you say, oh, this won't change. Hey, it's probably not you. It's probably some dead stuff that you just didn't know how to get rid of. You've been thinking it's you. That's why you're holding on to it. Once you realize that it's gone and it's going, it's not your true identity, you can get rid of it a whole lot easier. 10, but may the God of all grace. He's got everything you need to get to make the changes that you need to do. So I don't know how to do it. Guess what? You don't, know how, how, you don't have to know how to get there. 
You have to know to hold Jesus' hand. You do have to know that one thing. You may say, oh, I don't know theology. I don't know the Bible that well. Let me tell you something. If you can learn to hold Jesus' hand, say, Lord, I repent of my sins. I forgive the people that hurt me. And I'm asking you to help me. Those three prayers can get you a whole long way in the kingdom of God. That's what Isaiah 42, 16. I will take the blind by the hand and I will show them the way they don't know. On paths they don't know. So many times I say, Lord, I'm blind. I don't know how to get there. And then years later, I get this great verse. John Eldridge or somebody wrote about it. And I mean, I meditate on it for a long time. But to find out, oh my goodness. I don't have to know how to move forward. I only know the place where I've been. I don't know anything about where I'm going. I'm 51. I hope to live to, you know, 90 or whatever and be in good health. But guess what? I don't know anything in front of me. I know some things about, but I don't know anything this way. It's like, hey, don't worry. I will take you by the hand. I will show you the way you don't know on paths you don't know. Oh, and he spoke to me. I'm meditating this verse. He said, all you got to do is hold my hand. Quit squirming. You're stressed out about knowing all this stuff that you don't have to know. I will give it to you. Then he says what? I will turn your darkness today, meaning I will give you the revelation. I'll teach you what you need to know. But all your part is, is to hold my hand. I'll show you the way. I'll show you the path. Then I will give you revelation. Then I'll give you understanding. Then he says, I will make the crooked way straight. That is moral. When you hear about make, prepare the way of the Lord, that means get rid of the sin and be like Jesus, be holy. Well, I said, Lord, I don't know how to do that. He says, hey, I'll do it. If you'll hold my hand, stay connected to the vine, hold my hand. I'll show you the way, I'll show you the path. I'll open up your understanding. I'll make your darkness turn to light and I will make the crooked way straight. He says, I will do this for my name's sake. He says he's going to do it, not because I'm so great, not because I'm so perfect. He says he'll do it because this is the kind of God that he is. And I've been worried all, I don't know this and don't know that, and what about this? Just let the main thing be the main thing. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. I'll show you the way. My part is to stay as close to Jesus' hand as possible. One time he showed me a picture. I was praying. And I saw myself holding his hand in the Gulf of Mexico like a, helicopter, like a movie. And I'm holding the hand and I realized my hand was not strong enough. You know, I'm on the cliff, you know, and your hand gives out. You can't hold the hand in the western or whatever it is. And in this moment of panic, I think it was an inner healing thing with Ken, but I'm not, I can't remember for sure. But I remember the picture. When I couldn't hold on any longer, I let go. Jesus had had me here. But I didn't see that. I just saw that I, was, I, I didn't have the strength to hold on here. I have to do my part. But when I can't hold on, he still got me. Amen. That, was a, uh, that picture and that prayer brought incredible peace and got rid of so much anxiety in my heart. Because I realized God's expecting my part. But when I'm stretched beyond that, when I'm overwhelmed, he's got me. That's not a reason to be sloppy or not to do my part. But when I've done my part, it's not enough. Jesus got it covered. But may the God of all grace who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a little while. There's an end. That's the encouragement there. Compared to heaven and all eternity, it's a little time. There's a limit. That's the other encouragement there. He will perfect you. He will make you mature. He will restore you. He will establish you, make you like concrete, rock solid. He will strengthen you like the lion. And he will shake you to the foundation so that your foundation is in him and him alone and you'll make it. That's what he'll, he uses even the evil things the enemy brings in suffering to make you more and more like Jesus. That's how good he is. What the theologians say about this is they say this, Jesus handles sin sinlessly. Meaning God is so wonderful that even the evil of this world or the devil, that God will use it for his glorious purposes he will even use the sin, the evil, things he doesn't like, sicknesses that he's not for. Wicked things that happen. He's so wonderful. If we'll let him, he'll turn them into blessing and make us more and more like Jesus through them. That's his promise. There are things in which God expects us to do. All the things he expects us to do are the little things that anybody could do. Okay? He's just asking you to do the part. Be sober. Live in balance. 
Need grace to be balanced? That's called also in some translations self-control. You cannot be self-control or be in control of yourself without the control of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Self-control is one of the fruit or manifestation of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, Augustine said that our, it's like the scales of our mind and emotions, they're, they're messed up because of the fall. And, it, and we can't get them right unless the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit has taken his proper place and we're submitting to him, then we can stay in balance. We can see what's evil, what's good, and we can make good choices. But self-control is a manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. You cannot be in good self-control and do your part if you've not yielded and let the Holy Spirit take his place. Okay? So even that is something that you look for the God of all grace to do. But you have to do your part. You need to be looking into balance, asking the Lord to help you. Move in the direction of balance. You've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant, anticipating, understanding. Where have I blown it all these other times? How is the devil normally getting me? If you start being alert in the normal three or four or five things that you've been falling for for all these years, you'd eliminate the vast majority of things. Same thing, different person, same thing, different job, same thing, but it's the same stuff. Let the Lord heal you. Pursue healing. Pursue deliverance. Anyway, the Lord loves you, he cares about you. You have a part to do. Your part, your part is largely reporting for duty, yielding yourself to God, staying real close to him. He is the God of all grace. It's his power and his spirit that will give you the grace to change and the power to change and to become more and more like Jesus. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Well, that's one. I really appreciate it. We, we, in, we certainly intend to be. So thank you. She just said for the tape. She just said thank you for the, what we're doing here. We love it. We're just glad you come. This is part of what God's asked us to do, and we're so happy to do it. Yes, ma'am. I talk back to the devil. Oh, uh, Henry, Henry, Blackley, Blackley, I Henry Blackaby, I mentioned, but I also mentioned uh, Eldridge, John Eldridge. Oh, James Montgomery Boyce. He's dead, but he's really good stuff. It was on First, it was on, uh, first Peter. James Montgomery Boyce. James Boyce. B-O-I-C-E. James Boyce. He used to be on the radio, so in my dad's generation, probably if you lived... From Chicago East, you could have probably heard his sermons all the time, or many, for many years. He followed Barnhouse, which was even maybe greater. Barnhouse was one of the greats that was in Philadelphia. Tenth Presbyterian Church was sort of one of the original churches in the colonies. And it's been a church that's been faithful to the scriptures for all these years. My friend who is now pastor, uh, president of Wheaton College, Phil Riken, uh, was the pastor there, which is a real heavy hitter thing. Say so you're the pastor there, that's big time. It's like playing for the Yankees, but, or, you know. I'd say the Phillies, but they're not good enough. So, anyways, yes. Just, just an observation about perfection and maturity. Yes. You gave the illustration of like a broken arm. Yes. The that's the Greek. That's what they, that's the word that word's used. Yes, I, I mean, uh, sometimes I say it's being better than new. That's kind of what redemption is. It's being, so restoration, not simply going back to zero. When, because of the Holy Spirit, th this, some of this, just so you know, depends upon how you understand the fall. Did Adam and Eve have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? I believe they did. Okay, so it is to be restored to God's original intention, not just without sin, but walking by the Spirit in the garden. So that would be the question. But it is progressive. It is certainly... Whatever restoration means, it is far bigger than we could imagine. It's not just the, I think we often simply think of like not 
you know, oh, if, I, if, if God could get a hold of my life, I'd stop swearing, or I'd be able to get a hold of this lust, or this eating, or whatever it is. So we, we, have small, we just think getting rid of the negative. Restoration is certainly becoming what God always wanted us to become. In that sense, I absolutely agree with you, Cynthia. I think it is, it is progressive, and it's so marvelous, because I don't think we can imagine. It's, it's like trying to imagine something you've never been. When th that's why we can grow in Christ and be as excited about how much there is to grow, all the, because it just gets better and better. The, the upside is so big and so great, so I, I agree with you. I, I don't think the problem is with the word. I think it's true that we have much lower expectation that God does. And I, so I absolutely agree with what your heart's saying. Yes? Well, what the commentators would say is, as we know in science, when the arm is broken, it's actually stronger than the original condition at the break. So that's part of the analogy that they would talk about. Uh, I mean, the word comes from, it would have been commonly used with the mending of nets and the setting right of a broken. Those are, but I think the implicit part, I certainly would agree with the spirit of what you're saying. Um, not so much for that just one verse, but for the whole flow of what, what happens in sanctification. I mean, the more we become like Jesus, uh, it's... Tremendous. So I appreciate that. Anybody else? All right. How many people are in physical pain tonight? We've got a healthy group here. We've got just a couple sick people. Why do we even have this if you're going to be so healthy? All right. If you're in physical pain, would you stand? You don't have to come up. Would you stand? Now I want you to ask yourself a question. Is there anybody that I need to forgive? Because if you're a believer, the biggest thing that blocks God's healing is unforgiveness. So I'm just saying, don't, don't make it hard for us. Get right with Jesus. Anything, any known sin, just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything I forgot to repent of? If there is, do it right now. There, you can do it privately. Just, just tell the Lord you're sorry. Get right with the Lord. Is there anything you need to forgive? I'm not suggesting there is. I'm just asking you, just saying, do this. It's going to make it a lot better. And then the third thing, is there anything that God told me to do that I have not done? Now the Lord has reminded me in church, and I'll say, okay, I can't do it this second, but I will, when I get home, I'll get it done. At the next, so if there's something that you were supposed to do and you have not done, you tell them, okay, I will get it done. First thing tomorrow, the first reasonable time to do it. And I need to repent of anybody I need to forgive, including myself. Anything I have not done that God told me to do. All right. You feeling you got taken care of those things. All right. Now, Lord Jesus, we pray. Would you let your kingdom come now and your will be done right now in this place? Lord, we take authority of all sickness and all infirmity. And we just command this stuff to get out of the way right now in Jesus' wonderful and his precious name. Lord, we know what John said in 1 John 4. He said, we receive what we ask from him. Because we keep his commandments and we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And Lord, we receive. When we ask you, Lord, you're so gracious that we ask you to heal, you do. Lord, we ask in your name, by your power and strength. And, and Lord, we just celebrate in advance. Holy Spirit, come. And Lord, I take authority. Lord, I put the blood of Jesus between each of these people here and their generations. Any generational door which is open, any curse... Lord, any occultic practice, any curse, hex, spell, incantation, mind binding, or mind control practice, any opening of the occult, Lord, any words, evil words, evil actions, Lord, we take authority and we cancel and break those things in the blood of the new covenant. The covenant of sacrifice in the blood of Jesus that is greater than every other thing. We just ask you, Lord, to come. Would you stand in between these and every evil practice and evil curse? Lord, any evil intended, we stand there. Lord, we take authority of every spirit of darkness, every spirit of the earth, wind, water, air, fire, ground, underground, netherworld, satanic force of nature. We stand against every form of darkness in this world. In the wonderful and the precious name of Jesus. Lord, we speak your peace to, to muscles, to bones, to migraines, to shoulders, anger in the back, all kind of stuff there in the back, frustration, weariness, bone weariness, stress, Fear of never being loved, never being wanted, never being successful, never being protected. Lord, we come against every fear, every anxiety right now in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come. Would you come into the muscles, the cells, the bones, ligaments, tendons? 
Lord, we speak your freedom and your greatness. Lord, the wonder of your grace. We speak it into bodies right now. Lord, for everything which is physical and emotional, Lord, we speak peace to the heart. Where there's worry and fear, stress, anxiety that's been being carried year after year, Lord. Since things happen, rejections, molestation, things that happened in our youth and childhood, things that were done to us, things that we did, things that we're not sure whose fault it was. Lord, we give them all to you right now in Jesus' name. Oh, we love you, Lord. We release these things by the blood. Lord, you sort out. Lord, we repent for anything that was our part. Anything that wasn't, Lord, we just ask you to take it. But we cut and break any soul ties with any people, Lord, that harmed us or meant us harm or brought us harm right now in the blood of Jesus. We send back every part of them with the blessing, Lord. Filter and cleanse and bless them. Living or dead, Lord. You're the God of the living. To you, everyone's alive. All the unresolved grief, chronic grief, things have been stuck in every spirit of grief that's come and kept you from grieving and healing. Right now, we release you to heal the spirit of rejection, this deep sense of being unwanted and lonely. Lord, we take authority over that right now in Jesus' name. All the entanglements of darkness, where we have tried to fight the flesh and the sinful nature of other people by the flesh and not by the spirit. Lord, forgive us. We cannot conquer the flesh and other people and other wicked things by the flesh, but only by you, Lord. Lord, we rest in your great love right now. All right. If you're getting worse, let me know. You're getting worse. Don't stay. Don't, don't get down. Don't, don't, unless you're all better. But if you're not better, don't sit down. Are you getting, unless you can't stand because you're sick. Uh, anybody getting worse? Sometimes we start praying. It starts getting worse. Is it getting worse? Our guarantee is we won't make it worse. We can't keep it, but no, I'm just kind of kidding you. And no one's getting worse. Often when, when evils leave, often it gets a little worse. No one's getting worse. Yes, you're getting worse? Okay, that's good. If it's, if it's getting worse, if we're praying and it's getting worse, and we're not doing something to cause it, you know, we're not squeezing you or something, that's a good sign. That means that the evil that's in there is trying to get out. So would you just turn around, Lisa, and, and just pray there quietly, or, or not quietly, however you want, Pastor Lisa, you just do it. We're not going to tell you how to do it, you just do it. Anybody else where it's manifesting a little bit, it's kind of being, as we pray, it's like someone's poking the eye with this thing. Anybody else? Yes. All right, there's Denise. Who's back there? Who can we have? Jean, would you walk over there? Jean, young Jean, walk over there. Anybody else? When I'm praying for, if I'm with a thousand people and it starts getting worse, I'm glad because I know it's coming out. Okay? When, we're, when prayer is get, stirring it up, that means there's a spiritual part. It doesn't mean it's all a spiritual part. It doesn't mean you're possessed. It just means that's, that evil part is getting ready to get out. Because we start asking in Jesus' name and it gets antagonized, that's a good sign. It's a good sign. That gives me hope. Ah, the Lord's going to come. That's great. The Lord is coming. That's great. Gets me excited. I don't tell people. Well, I do. Sometimes I'll say, oh, I'm glad it's getting worse. And they look at me like I'm mean. But I am because I'm like, oh, that means the Lord's going to get it. That's good. Anybody is getting better. One person getting, only, everyone else is the same. That's all right. Okay, one person is getting better. How much better? Pretty much. All right, Lord, would you continue that, Lord? Now, Lord Jesus, we ask, Lord, it says in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit came and gave a grace for healing on Jesus. So, Lord, we pray for the grace for healing right now. We ask for every gift and every grace. And, Lord, we speak blessing restoration, healing. Lord, that you would make us better than new in Jesus' name. Better than new in Jesus' name. What do you have that's hurting? Glory, what is hurting? If you can say, if it's not indelicate or something. Back? Rena, would you put your hand on her back? Just bless her back in Jesus' name. Yes, what's hurting? Back? Uh, someone that would, Cynthia, would you put your hand on her back? Andy, what's hurting you? Uh, several, things. several things. Anyone that you can name? Your hands? All right, well, Don, would you come over there? 
You got old Pastor Don hiding over there. We need, a, we need someone. He's got a gift of healing. Here he is. There you go. Thank you, Lord. He's old free will Baptist. He's going to put a hurting on you. Pepe, what do you got? Back? Would you come up here? I, won't, I don't think I'm going to embarrass you since we know each other well. Yes. I feel like I was getting better, but then I kind of like started moving around my Your ankle? All right, who have we got back there? Joy, would you walk over on her ankle? We won't forget about you, Joy. You walk over there. Pray for her ankle. What do you have? Feet. Feet? How bad are they? They hurt. Okay, if one to ten, where are they right now? Um, right foot's feeling a little gotten. It's gotten since she talked. It's gotten a little, um, it feels pressure. It's like I don't get blood going to the feet. Okay. Would you want to sit down for just a second? Mm -hmm. Is this your husband? All right, so we're not going to ask him to hold your feet if he's not your husband. Yeah, but you, you put your feet up here on his knee, if you don't mind. Yeah. Put them both up there. I'm assuming he doesn't mind. The Lord Jesus, we love you. We bless right now. We bless and we speak healing and blessing. Lord, whatever it is, Lord, you know. But Lord, you're King of kings and Lord of lords. And we just release your healing and your goodness, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Lord. Pour out your love. Thank you, Lord. There is something bigger than all the natural processes, the aging, the decay, the, the DNA, the, all the... Lord, you're bigger than all that. We speak new creation and blessing in this body, on these feet. And Lord, if they manifest some other problem of uh, blood flow, Lord, we ask you, make it right. Make it better than new in Jesus' name. All right, would you check it and let's see how you're doing. Worse, better, same. I don't know if you could tell there if you had to stand. I don't know what you'd have to do. Worse, same, or better. Please do. How's the back coming? Andy, how are you doing? How's the ankle doing? How's the ankle? It's moving. It's moving. Good. Now, if it's moving around, it's going to go out. Tell it to go out, Joy. That's my little sweetheart, that Joy Justice right there. That's my oldest child. Get a hold of that, Joy. I came in submission, and as I walk here, I feel better. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you bless it and strengthen it? He said he felt better walking up here. Thank you, Lord, more of your love, your goodness, and your grace. Holy Spirit, come. Strengthen, Lord. We ask not just for a moment, but we pray, make it new. The disc, the ligaments, tendons, the alignment, whatever it is, Lord, we pray your kingdom coming right now, your will being done right now in Jesus' wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. How are we, how are we doing? Carmen, how are you doing? How are we doing? How are you doing? Your headaches now? Move to your head? It's gone. Oh, it's gone. Praise the Lord. That's what we expect. How are you doing, Andy? What's that? Hands are better. Hey, listen. That's better than a doctor's appointment. Thank you, Lord. How are your feet doing? It's okay. It's, I'm not... It's a little stuck. That's all right. It does get stuck sometimes. Put your hand right there. Lord Jesus, where it's stuck, unstuck it. Lord. Lord, your healing, your grace. We let all of it get out, never come back. Don't care where it came from, how it got there. We just say, Lord Jesus, in your wonderful name, by your authority, we just speak. You told us to heal the sick. And in Jesus' name, we speak healing right here, right now. Thank you, Lord. Move it, see how we're doing. How are we doing? Oh, glory. <laughs> oh, glory. <laughs> Gotta watch out for Cynthia. Here we go. Thank you, Lord. Get it. How are we doing? It's on, the, it's on there, the right? On the big toe? But you put your hand on the big toe. Lord, your kingdom, your love, your grace, your goodness, Lord. In the Lord's Prayer, he said, this is what Jesus said. You pray like this. Thy kingdom come now. Aorist imperative, meaning something which has started in the past and finished now. Bang. It's happened now. It's a command. It's not thy kingdom come. Right? <laughs> That may be off key, right? But it's, thy kingdom come now. Thy will be done now. That's what it is. On earth as is in heaven. 
So if it won't be that way in heaven, you have permission to ask Jesus to make it like heaven now. It's actually a command. Lord, your kingdom coming right now in your wonderful name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. How are you doing? Okay, now I'm just going to say I heard that feel like what you were preaching on tonight. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, here's we're gonna we're gonna pray, and I think Don's gonna pray for you, and, and then, but before you go, don't let it go tonight. Don't let it go. Carmen, how are you doing? Are you doing all right? All right. While you're tingling, how's Denise doing? While you're tingling, walk over there. Walk over there while you're tingling. I mean, while you're standing, if you're standing, you might as well be praying for someone. If you're tinkling, the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit come. Lord, thank you. Joy Justice, how's that ankle? She disappeared on me. Joy's down there, came and find her. How's that ankle doing? Oh, Susie's right there. Susie, you and Joy get that hold of that. They pray for hundreds and hundreds of people, seeing them healed. We got... All right, Lord Jesus, we love you. We pray, Lord, that this, just your grace for healing. Lord, we thank you for what's already happened, but Lord, we know you're going to do more. Physically healing. But Lord, we also pray that you heal our hearts. You set us free from the power of darkness. Lord, you restore us. Lord, by your gospel, by the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, you restore us in our generations and our families. And we ask for it, Lord. So, Lord, as we pray in these next moments, Lord, for people, and we lay hands on them, Lord, we ask you that you would pour out the greatest good and the most amount of your kingdom that we could possibly handle. That in the biggest and greatest way we could receive all the good things you have for us. You are the God of all grace, as 1 Peter says, 5, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're getting ready to do. And we celebrate your wonderful name. And it's your name we pray, and we glorify you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen.